case this morning is De Tournay versus the City of Coral Gables. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, may it please the court, I'm Andrew Dickman. I represent the, um, the appellants here, the uh, Lisa De Tournay, Brenda Randall, uh, and the Riviera Neighborhood Association. <laughs> I understand I have 10 minutes. I'd like to reserve, if I may, a few minutes, two minutes for- Two remote. minutes, all right. Okay. Um, quite frankly, we wanted a fair trial on the merits, and we didn't get one. The judge was a substitute judge who only had the city's trial brief. She admitted that uh, she was given this trial the night before or the day before. Uh, the case uh, file had been lost. The only thing that Mr. she had. Mr. Dickman, you need to speak a little louder for me. The only please. thing that she had in her possession was the city's trial brief, and that's it. Um, <clears throat> the judge had decided that the affirmative de defenses that were brought by the intervener, which were the core of the case, were a distraction. And she immediately went to the issue of whether the city had discretion to enforce its code violations. The judge made three critical decisions that resulted in the, that we had not received a fair decision. First is standing. She allowed the city to file a surprise motion and the remaining of the trial ended up in a hearing on the motion to dismiss for lack of standing. We asserted standing was in the, the trial completed. Was the trial was completed? It, was the case simply dismissed? It, simply, it was simply dismissed. So it never was. We complete. never had a full trial. It was never complete. We started the trial, uh, never had a chance to have. How long had the case been pending? It had been pending for four years, three to four years. Actually, longer than that. It had, we had filed it in 2000 and... Standing had never been raised? Standing had never been raised. There was a motion for summary judgment um, before Judge was Escarte. It, there was a motion to did dismiss. You argue, did you argue that they had waived it? We did argue that they had waived it. Yes, sir, we did. In fact, we argued that they waived it and that they um, could not bring it up on the, the eve of the ending of the trial or at the last minute. In fact, I was, I'm from Naples and I received a fax at 5.30 or in the morning, actually in the morning of uh, going into court to my office in Naples. I had is, no opportunity is standing to standing one of those, one of those defenses that has to be raised by motion or is um, lost? I believe that it has, I mean, they, they raised it under a, um, a renewed, they called it a renewed motion to dismiss, and I believe that they had waived it and it needed to be heard in a fair hearing. The we were surprised by this. The case no was obviously at issue, correct? Excuse uh, me? The case was obviously at issue, presumably, because the trial began. There was a complaint and an answer and so on. The, the complaint absolutely asserts that we have standing. We, do, we demonstrate that. We have also, we demonstrate that in the counts. We have affidavits stating that we have standing. We meet but the Renard Mr. test. Mr. Dixon, Dickman, I think the remedy that your clients were seeking was to force the city to pursue an enforcement action, correct? I mean, was there anything else that, that your clients were seeking other than to force the city to the, to this, go forward with an enforcement action? No, we were asking, yes, in fact, we were asking the city to do what it's obligated to do under the code. It had issued three citations, and even the Besides city that, was there anything, in other words, you wanted them to, inf to go forward with their enforcement action. Was there anything else your clients were also seeking? That's it. We wanted them, we, we came into this asking the court, because we couldn't get, after three years of asking the city, to go forward after they had abated it, that we had, on under state statute, we had gone forward and said that we need a declaration of our rights and an injunction to enforce, to have the city act, to actually act on their code enforcement um, citations and the city's own declaration from the city attorney in the building and zoning department that it was an illegal operation. So, so your clients were seeking uh, we're basically suing the city to, in effect, force the city to sue or um, pursue action against a third party. 
to actually continue. Which is somewhat unusual. No, to continue action because they had started the action. Well, continue action. That's, but that seems a little unusual. In other words, it would seem to me if your clients were injured, um, by the actions of a third party. Your clients had a cause of action directly against the third party. You're but it's somewhat unusual to, to sue one party so that, and have them go again sue a third party. The, the reason we did that, Your Honor, first of all, under if everybody were to bring, and I believe you're referring to a nuisance action, common law nuisance action, if everyone were to, instead of ask the city to follow the zoning code, in this case, they had to have a conditional use permit, which means that they could get what they wanted to dip, but it would have to have a hard look under a public hearing. However, they didn't do that. So what we were asking for is, you know, if, we, if everyone in the city were to have to bring common law nuisance action, the courts would be full of cases like this. That's what zoning codes are for, is to prevent these types of nuisances. This well, it might have been one, one common law, if, if in fact it met the requirements, one common law nuisance action would solve the alleged problem, would it not? If under in this case, to, to, for us to file a common law nuisance case against if, this party, if it existed, we feel we, if, if, if all it, of this was a nuisance, you'd get an injunction. In this case, the city had started its process. It had gone down that road. It created, it, it entered into an oral, unwritten, yes, time-unlimited well, agreement. I think we're familiar agreement. with that, but let me ask you, if, the, if we ordered the city to pursue its enforcement action, would the city have the authority to uh, settle that enforcement action? Or would Often, they? Oftentimes, no, because. Uh, the, I mean, the, if we the, entered an order and because, we ordered the city, pursue your enforcement action, could the city in, let's say, a year say, you know, we're going to settle that? Or would they not have that authority? As a question, as a the plain language of the ordinances says that whatever the intervener is doing at that property, it has to meet one of two different types of ordinances. And so, if they so have, they ha they would not have the authority to settle. I don't believe they do. I think that they have the authority to to basically say we'll abate and give you a certain time limit to come into compliance. I think that's fair to say. But, but there's no settlement. There's no. They wouldn't have the authority. So I, I don't think they can. Let negotiate. me ask you this, I don't Mr. Think Dickman. They can negotiate. Mr. Dickman, if I may, you're aware of the cases that talk about how a uh, a a jurisdiction has discretion in terms of allocating enforcement resources. I mean, we all know of a lot of laws that are not being enforced, and a lot of that's because you know you there's only so many enforcement actions the state attorney or a city could do at a time. How do you deal with the cases that say it's really up to the city to determine how they're going to allocate their enforcement resources? I believe that when a city starts down a path and actually brings a violator to an administrative hearing, which is a public hearing, puts people on notice, and then stops it without any notice to the public or the people that are adversely affected, I believe at that point they can do what I just said, which is temporarily abate it and allow the property owner to become legal, but they can't all of a sudden, since they've gone down that road, decide we're not going to allocate our resources to do this. I if think the, that If the city had not begun the um, enforcement action, could your clients bring a lawsuit to force them to begin an enforcement action? I think that would have been a very different situation. Had the city not led us down that road and they said, we're going to make, we believe that. I know, but legally, I mean, from a, I I'm trying, think, to, trying think, to work I think this legally out. Our, I think legally our basis would be more difficult, but our choice here is because we were led down a road that said the city, and they made their own determinations that this is an illegal activity. So we went down a road for a long time saying that not only us, but the city telling the, the intervener that you're illegal. And then in the middle of it, they said, no, we're going to abate it. And then Have these citations been withdrawn or dismissed? As no, as from our position, they're still abated. However, on well, footnote from your seven, position, footnote has, seven, has have they been withdrawn or dismissed by the city? 
you know. The answer know, brief know, on footnote the city, seven. The city, do you know? I mean, Excuse me. I believe that they're still active. I think that they've just been abated and they haven't lifted the abatement. Mr. Is Dickman, it, let me ask you just a quick question. Um, the city never raised standing as an affirmative defense, correct? That's correct. And you argued specifically that they did not raise it as an affirmative defense below. Did you argue that? You did argue that. That, that, that they did not have it? That, when when, when they, they brought it when up? When they renewed their motion. We objected vociferously. Of, of course, it's in the transcripts. Was it required that they raise it as an affirmative defense in order to preserve it for bringing up? Yes. What is your authority for that? The authority that I have is that they, um, that under the, the, the codes that have shown that you can't bring it up until uh, before a judgment is rendered, and here we are in trial, or what was called a trial. Well, they, if it's, they is, weren't, this, they is, weren't this, even is this a matter of subject matter jurisdiction? The court believes. If it is a matter of subject matter jurisdiction, then it can be raised at any time. Correct. They, this was a matter of the court's jurisdiction that they believed that we did. They didn't have jurisdiction because now that there was a, a last-minute motion to dismiss, renewed mo they call it a renewed motion to dismiss based on standing. They did have a motion to dismiss, but they never argued standing years before. So we came. But if it is subject matter jurisdiction that we are dealing with, it can be raised at any time, including here. Correct? Your Honor, even if it, let's put aside the issue of whether or not they can bring that up. We have standing. We have absolutely standing under the Renard standard. We have special injury. Even the city attorney himself, the new city attorney, went into the backyard of Lisa the attorney looking at the property. This is not a vast waterway as they state. This is a canal a mile long where two Two of the uh, of my clients live within several hundred feet of this activity. There are at least 50 of the homeowners association members that live on this. We absolutely have a injury, special injury in kind. That's different than the community at large, not in degree, and that's what the Renard case say, and that's based on voucher. That's clearly what the special injury is. We have special injury, and to start this going down this rabbit hole about whether or not they can bring it up or not bring it up, well, that, that shouldn't even be an issue because we have standing. It was, it, was, it was discussed. It was in our complaint. It's in our affidavits. If we had the ability to have a trial, which we didn't, we didn't even have opening statements, we could have put plenty of testimony and evidence in the record that says we have standing. So putting aside the issue of whether or not they could raise it or not, we still have standing. Let's assume that they, they could. I guess we the tricky part standing. is your clients might have standing to bring a nuisance action against the, the people operating the uh, illegal marina, whatever the term is. But do they have standing to sue the city to force the city to bring an action, which is quite an unusual cause of action? Do you have any cases your, your Honor. where someone has sued a city or a prosecutor and said, you must proceed with a lawsuit? Actually, I have a Florida statute. It's 86.02. You don't have any cases? Let's well, start with the cases. Any cases? Your Honor, those are, those are, in, our, uh, those are in our briefs. Uh, uh, you know, fine. Then what's the statute? Please the statute's 86.021, and it says any person, and I'll abbreviate, any person whose rights, status, or equitable or legal relations are affected by a municipal ordinance uh, may have determined any question or construction of validity arising under such municipal ordinance uh, can obtain a declaration of rights, status, or other equitable or legal relations thereunder. So we have two ordinances on the books that are absolutely on point about this waterway and what you can and can't do on it. The Mr. city Dickman. issued citations, and this statute right. says that we have the ability to ask the court because we were waiting for years and years for the city to act on this abatement, and they Mr. didn't. Mr. So Dickman, your time has gone well over. I will still give you two minutes for rebuttal. For rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dickman. <clears throat> may, it may it please the court. 
Uh, Gerald Cope, Ackerman Center Fit for the City of Coral Gables. With me are Elizabeth Hernandez from Ackerman Center Fit, uh, City Attorney Craig Lean, uh, and Santiago Echemendia of Two Cardenas, who represents Amase. Um, it has been agreed that I will do the argument, but uh, Mr. Echemendia is available if the court has any questions uh, regarding Amase. Mr. Cope, uh, may I, may I uh, start up by talking about standing? Let's discuss standing. It, you admit that the city never raised uh, standing as an affirmative defense, correct? Uh, yes, I do, Your Honor. Now, how do, you, how do you deal then with some of the cases from the third and the fourth that say standing, the issue of standing is an affirmative defense that can be waived? Uh, I deal with that because there's a special rule that relates to, that relates to uh, standing specifically. Um, though the general principle is one of waiver, uh, I would cite in particular the Maynard case from the second DCA. Uh, in Maynard, the issue of standing was raised after trial on a post-trial motion to vacate a verdict. Uh, and the, the, they did a very, very lengthy and thorough analysis of the Florida law in the area and concluded that it could be raised. Uh, this court subsequently in the Reliance case has cited that, uh, has cited Maynard with approval. It was for a slightly different proposition. It's for the proposition that is relevant here, though, because the proposition, and this court also said this in bank in Famiglietti, that the obligation to, on uh, standing is to raise it at some point during the trial proceedings. Um, but the, the relevant case law uh, states uh, and I think you can see that the that uh, standing is a little bit different from a lot of other issues, and if it doesn't go squarely in the state system to uh, subject matter jurisdiction, it is, it is certainly a first cousin. Well, let, let's talk about the statute in question, though. The um, statute 86.021, and I know that there's not really any cases, but if you if we go to the plain meaning of the statute, it seems to be almost a, a deck action that a person can uh, use in order to find out what their rights are under a particular ordinance or a statute or a regulation. Your so Honor, I have two answers to that. Uh, the first one is that the 5th DCA and Messett v. Cohen has specifically held that if you are asking for a land use declaration of this type, uh, then you have to have standing in order to uh, get that declaration. Otherwise, you could have interlopers who really have no uh, no interest or no specific enough interest uh, going to court asking for, de for declarations. So in the 5th DCA uh, has actually addressed the, the issue and has said to get the declaratory judgment, you do have to have uh, standing and meet the special injury um, re requirement. Um, standing requires, a, as you say, as you just said, a special injury uh, yes, to, Your the, Honor. to the plaintiffs. In this particular case, you have a series of plaintiffs up and down this waterway who are, in fact, injured greater than people away from the waterway. Is that, uh, not, is that not special injury by any common definition of special injury? Your Honor, we, we disagree with that. I, you, you've, that's, that is an excellent question, and you've pinpointed exactly Mr. what Cope, the— every uh, once in a while I get lucky. <laughs> you've pinpointed exactly the question, or the, 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 the difference of, of legal analysis between the plaintiffs and, and the, the city. Um, what they have said is the kind of damages appellants are experiencing is factually different from non-waterway homeowners. We, we say that's a false dichotomy. Why? The purpose of, because the purpose of the regulation is to regulate where and how and how many boats are tied up or using the, the waterway. And that is a, a benefit that is conferred not just on the abutting or the waterway homeowners. There are many of us who are landlocked. Uh, who have or and used to how, have? How, or, how are the landlocked people benefited by who can tie because up to many the waterway? Landlocked, because many landlocked people have boats, use boats, use canoes, use paddle boards, and actually physically use the waterway. Uh, and arguably, those people who may be who are who have their their boat in their garage, um, arguably, are closer to the water than the people that are just. Li uh, so your argument, Mr. Cope, is that if any if everybody is injured, nobody is injured. Uh, basically, that's, that's, that's the principle. That's the principle of law, correct? Well, I'm not. But if the city, uh, if the city, if the city injures a couple of people, they can sue. But if everybody is equally injured by their failure to do whatever they do, 
Essentially, yes, then Your Honor. If they, isn't, isn't, that, isn't that the rule of law? I think that is the rule of law. So and, and our contrary, our, Isn't that contrary to, uh, contrary to the American way? I don't believe so, Your Honor. The, um, uh, the, the, these principles, really, the special injury principles, really stem, as I understand it, historically, uh, from, from nuisance law. And there certainly is, and we don't deny this, an obligation on the part of the city to, enfor to enforce its ordinances. But the question, uh, as Judge, Judge Logue has alluded to, is what the uh, uh, well, association— you didn't, you didn't enforce it until the, until the very end. I mean, don't you waive it at some point? Uh, I'm sorry. You mean the the issue of the issue of standing? Standing, standing, standing. Yes. Uh, Don't you waive it at some point? At some point. I mean, the, I think we have a case out of this court that says that it is waived here if it was not raised below. I, I, I completely agree with that. It had. I think all of the cases are clear that. So the, it is the, not. The, if if that is the case, then it is not a matter of subject matter jurisdiction. Correct. If it if it if it can be if it is way if it can be waived in in a court of appeal, it is not a matter of subject matter jurisdiction. Um, that, would, that would seem to be correct, Your Honor, but the other side hasn't argued that, and I, and I have not looked into it, to be perfectly frank with you. And uh, one of Mr. the things— Cope, Mr. Cope, the, yeah. the idea of, of standing ultimately goes to separation of powers. Isn't that true? Yes. And, and um, the idea that um, if a few people are injured, they can sue, but if everyone's injured, there's no judicial solution, is based upon the idea, well, in those situations, there's a political solution. Yes, Your Honor. And, you know, where everyone's injured, that's when the, the courts step aside and we let the, the democratic process proceed. Uh, yes, Your Honor. And if I can just briefly uh, state what happened in the case, there were citations issued under two ordinances, the private yacht basin ordinance and the, what I'll call the tie-up ordinance uh, in, in 04. There was a, Are those citations still in effect? There is a dispute about that, Your Honor, and we felt because this potentially impinged on two things. One is uh, it, it, we're, we're, of course, asking the court to affirm, but if the court were to disagree with us, we wanted to alert the court that in effectuating relief, let's say the court uh, concluded that there should be a reversal and the city should be directed to proceed against Amase, we wanted the court to be aware that there is a dispute right now as to whether those were canceled or not. There is a notation in the computer system and on the citations that they were canceled. The city believes that that is a Scrivener's error, and what it was supposed to mean was a cancellation of the hearing. But we anticipate that if, the, if any proceedings go forward uh, as a result of this, that Amase will argue that they were canceled. Well, but there, we believe it is not. We th while we thought we had to alert the court about that, we do not think this moots the issue because, in fairness, what they are really saying is whether these citations are live or not, their beef is that they want the city to move forward and proceed against Amase. That's the bottom line of where they are. But if, if this were reversed, and I'm not say saying it would be, but if it were reversed, it really would go back for a trial because the trial did not. Uh, Your Honor, again, I hate these words reversal, but um, the, let me, let me, let me uh, flag one thing that has not come up in either of the arguments so far. The trial judge in this case made alternative rulings, Only one, and, and either is sufficient, uh, either ruling, if affirmed, should result in affirmance of the judgment. Standing is one issue. But the other issue was, going into the hearing, the question that the association asked for a declaratory judgment on is, is Amase operating an illegal private yacht basin? The private yacht basin ordinance is in our brief on page, uh, on page three. And after hearing the testimony, the judge made an alternative ruling uh, that, that indicated that uh, the the uh, facility which they have, which is boats tied up along a bulkhead with water and electric, but that's all, that's it. There's no supporting structures. The judge's legal interpretation of the ordinance as applied to this facility is not a private yacht basin. And she did rule that we have a disagreement with the other side on whether she ruled on this or not, but I ask the court, if you look at the order and final judgment, there's a statement in there which I found very mysterious for a long time, but I think is easily explainable. And this is when she got to the second issue, the judge said, even if the court, 
she meant the plaintiffs, do have standing, the court finds that it could never answer the question set forth in the count, that's count one, because the question presented in count one seeks declaratory relief as to a private yacht basin. And then in the next two sentences, she goes on to say no private yacht basin. Now, what's the judge talking about? If you go to the second amended complaint, tab eight, page nine, the wherefore clause, the wherefore clause says, wherefore plaintiffs request the court make a declaration whether the private yacht basin is operating pursuant to the city's zoning regulations. And what's the judge saying? False premise. The premise of the wherefore clause is it's a private yacht basin. The judge is saying, wait a minute, the threshold question, the entire question I'm supposed to decide first is, well, are they a private yacht basin or not? And then when she looked at the ordinance, which has a list of activities such as docks, slips, piers, pilings, bollards, anchorage, mooring, and buildings and structures as are required for the operation, it's undisputed that there are no buildings and structures. Mr. Cope. And so she, I'm sorry. Mr. Cope. Yes, Your Honor. Is standing a matter of subject matter jurisdiction? Your Honor, it was not, that issue was not raised by the other side, and I, as a matter of Florida law, I can, cannot, standing here, answer that. Um, we would be happy to submit that's, something that's, on that. That's if, fine. You've been standing for more than your time, Mr. <laughs> uh, Cope, so we'll give the other side two minutes. Thank you. Uh, if, if I may wrap up, uh, just to be sure that the court saw it, we filed supplemental authority last week, Rule 1. This is on the settlement issue. Rule 1.730B. Mr. Cope, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just to hit two minutes. Point. Yes, sir. Real quickly. We're asking for you to remand for a fair trial. That's what we want. We want a fair trial. Um, regarding the, tes the testimony Well, you on didn't get a trial. Excuse me? You didn't get a trial. We didn't get a trial. It was, that, it, was, it was dismissed. That's why we want to have this remanded back for that a fair trial. That might have been fair. Excuse me? That might have been the fair result. Well, we, we believe we didn't have reversed, a fair trial. If you get reversed, you get a trial. If it gets reversed, you get a trial, right? That's, well, we would like to have a trial, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, regarding the statute, and um, uh, Judge Cope mentioned that it had to do with land use, that's zoning. This is what we're talking about is zoning. Um, the waterway, he's saying that if someone lives on Lejeune and has a kayak and take their, and go up, well, First of all, this is a restricted waterway. It's a manatee zone, and you have to have a specific sticker to be up there. It is very limited. Not everyone can take their there's motor no, boats. There's no easements where you can't just walk onto Mr. Torney's property and say, I'd like to Absolutely you know, not. take my kayak here Absolutely and, and not. drop it. Absolutely not. It is a very restricted waterway. Um, which is different than the waterway where the Cocoa Plum Circle is. Which is different than the Miami go. River. Take the Miami River. That would be different. But this is a very restricted canal. Uh, on the Some issue, people can't go up and down that canal. You can take a kayak, the manatees, but the manatees can go freely. What about the people? Well, that we want them to go freely up and down, and that's one of the reasons why we're afraid. And, but I don't know if manatees have standing at the moment. Um, the, uh, we believe that a, a case that's been in court from 2007 to 2011, and then they bring up standing and we claim that it's waived, we believe that that's just fundamentally unfair. As far as the, 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 canceled, the canceled citations, this again is a, a situation of unfairness. This is not in the record. Judge Cope, I understand he wants to make you aware of that, but this is just really unfair. That's fine. We're just focused, we just focus on the record. If okay. it's not in the record. And then finally, the that. testimony on the private yacht basin, there's all kinds of confusion about that. The fact of the matter is they have a commercial activity for mooring 22 boats there, and there are two uh, codes that are directly on point about how you actually have that type and of that mooring. Was, that point was raised sua sponte by the court. I mean, standing was really what was argued that morning, right? Stan this whole thing ended because of standing. Right. But we never got to the merits of and I believe the judge was confused about this issue of private yacht basin. In this, right. so. Thank you, counsel. We'll take a brief.